Hey everybody, welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. I'm Jenny olson Silic, and we've got a great show lined up for you this week. I spent a day out on the ice with a young man who has a passion for fishing at the age of 11. You won't want to miss it. We had a great time out there. And Jimmy and Jordan have some other fun in store for us this week too. Well, that's right, Jenny. We're actually going to kick off this week's show in the Upper Peninsula, tagging along with the Predator Prey Program. It's an in-depth study on white-tailed deer in the Upper Peninsula, talking about predation and also deer survival rates throughout the winter. It's a very in-depth story. You won't want to miss that. And we're also going to have time to stop in at a traditional archery show and let you see what that is all about. Lots of good stuff on this week's show. You stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger. It's time for Michigan Out of Doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze, Dancing on the pine forest floor The autumn colors catch your eyes Here come the crystal winter skies It's Michigan, Michigan out of doors What a beautiful day in the woods Someday our children all will see This is their finest legacy the wonder and the love of Michigan As the wind comes whispering through the trees The sweet smell of nature's in the air Great lakes to the quiet stream, shining like a sportsman's dream. It's a love of Michigan we all share. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by By Country Smokehouse, a sportsman's destination since 1988. Featuring varieties of homemade sausage, jerky, brats, and gourmet entrees. Holiday gift boxes can be assembled in-store or online. Details at countrysmokehouse.com. By Angler Quest Pontoons, a mid-Michigan company building boats for fishermen by fishermen. Angler Quest Pontoons are designed for comfort and functionality. On the web at anglerquestpontoons.com. Nice Come Soaking in the rich tradition of Michigan hunting for over 30 years, Vanguard is proud to sponsor our friends at Michigan Out of Doors TV. A few weeks back, I was able to spend a day with the folks from the Michigan Predator Prey Project. This particular trip, we would be checking deer traps in an area where the deer winter just north of Kenton, Michigan. The Michigan Predator Prey Project is now in its third phase. Um, it started in 2009 down in the Escanaba area in what would be considered the low snowfall zone. We moved up to Crystal Falls in the traditional mid snowfall zone in around 2012. And then we've been in the high snowfall zone working here west of Berga since 2016. Uh, the overall objective of the study is to investigate the role of winter weather predators and habitat on white-tailed deer fawn survival. And in doing so, we're surveying um, population estimates for coyote, wolf, black bear, and bobcat, and white-tailed deer throughout all three of these snowfall regions. So this is a deer trap. Um, and the way it works, it's got a heavy door that's holding up this mesh that's just basically gravity, gravity fed. And a rat trap here in the back that's tied to this piece of fishing line. So there's gonna be a bit of a chain reaction when the deer is feeding along and hits this fishing line. We'll set off this rat trap and drop the door. And we check these every day so that the animal's not gonna spend too much time in there. So today we're checking deer traps, and this is our last year of trapping deer in winter in the high snowfall study area. We're targeting pregnant adult females, but we're catching other deer just because we can't control which deer walk into the traps. Um, the goal when we catch an, a pregnant adult female is that we're gonna put in a vaginal implant transmitter and a GPS tracking collar. And so we're really looking for two important things out of these deer. The first is related to the tracking collar. That's gonna let us know this deer's movements for the next three years. And it's also gonna let us know her survival status. It's got a four hour mortality switch on it so that typically if a deer dies and stops moving, four hours later it will send a signal to a satellite which will then send me an email which means that we can get out there after a mortality occurs often within eight to 10 hours when you can really still see exactly what happened. And that's important because especially up here in the winter, a meat food source is pretty scarce. And so a lot of other predators are gonna start visiting a, a kill site pretty quickly. And so you need to get there fast if you wanna actually know what happened to a deer. Most of the deer that have been captured this year appear to be pretty healthy, but time will tell as March and April are pivotal months when it comes to deer survival. This doe was in good shape, and like almost every adult doe in the area, was pregnant. 
One of the main purposes that we're trying to capture the adult female deer at this time of year is because this is while they're pregnant and we're going to put in a vaginal implant transmitter if they are and that will allow us to catch their fawns at the time that they're born in the summer and that allows us to track fawn survival basically from the day that they're born um, and that's really important because a lot of things that happen to fawns will happen within the first day or two of life. So what we're doing right now is we're just making sure that this doe is pregnant before we place a vaginal implant transmitter in her. And at this point, it's usually the deer are long enough, far enough along in pregnancy that we can also address fecundity. So we can see, see whether she has one or two fawns. And that'll not only help us in the summer when we're trying to locate her fawns, but also um, give us some idea of the reproductive output of the deer in this population. If they're two and a half years old or older, it's held steady at above 95% ever since we've been up here, and that's even been through years when buck doe ratios have been as much as six or seven does per buck. And so even when there aren't that many bucks around, the doe pregnancy rates seem to maintain um, pretty high levels, which is good. The yearling pregnancy rates vary quite a bit year to year, and overall it's about year in and year out, maybe two-thirds of the yearlings that tend to be pregnant, um, and a lot of that will depend on just the conditions those fawns were born in and, and what sort of winter they had to go through. Since we've moved to the high snowfall study area in the last two years, we've seen some interesting changes from previous study areas. One is certainly related to deer movement patterns, where as the snow gets much deeper and plays a larger role in, in the deer life history up here, we have much higher migration rates for further distances. So, whereas when we were working close to Escanaba, only about 15% of the deer that we were monitoring migrated over two miles in a given year between summer and winter home ranges, that figure jumped up to about 60% in the mid snowfall study area near Crystal Falls. And now in the high snowfall study area, that's about 90%. And of those 90% of the deer that do migrate, the average distance is 22 and a half miles so far. And so these deer are covering quite a bit of ground to get between their summer and winter ranges. And that also means that there's a big disjunct between habitat use of these deer at different times of year. And so managing habitat for a deer in the high snowfall study area is gonna bring on its own challenges because it's not like in areas where deer don't migrate, if you want to take care of a deer, you only need to worry about the same home range year round. We have one deer that travels between Western Iron County and Ontonagon County, a little bit over 50 miles, and she's been doing that for three years now. And during that time period, I believe that she has had locations on her annual home range within six different deer management units. And that kind of highlights the challenges of managing deer in this, in this uh, region of the UP where even a very large segment of land like a deer management unit is not by any means gonna contain a deer on a year-round basis. One question that a lot of hunters would like to have answered is how big of a role do predators really play in overall deer mortality? But as it turns out, this is a difficult question to answer as there are many other factors involved. With doe mortality up until this point, overall it's been about 70% of mortality has been at least proximally indicated as predation. And with fawn mortality, so that's deer that are less than a year old, that's about 80% proximally indicated as predation. But by proximally, I mean that a predator is what actually killed the deer at the end, but that doesn't mean that malnutrition and poor habitat isn't playing a huge role. And whether that's hiding cover for fawns or winter browsing cover for deer or summer browsing cover for adult deer where the amount of fat that they carry into the winter is going to play a huge role in their ability to evade predators late in the winter. Um, and so a large proportion of the adult deer especially that we find predated in late winter have a bone marrow condition that's almost completely consistent with deer that are dying of starvation and what that indicates is that deer is in a severely weakened state and it's really hard to separate at that point exactly what killed that deer? Was it the predator that finally did it in the end? Or was it, you know, the, the habitat that kind of led it to be in that condition in the first place? There's some interesting geographic trends that we've observed coming from the low snowfall to the high snowfall region. Uh, one is we're seeing increases in wolf population density going from south to north. And those are um, actually occurring at the same time that we're observing decreases in coyote populations from south to north across the snowfall gradient. Uh, bobcat populations appeared relatively similar between Escanaba in the low snowfall zone and Crystal Falls in the mid snowfall zone. Uh, however, they're at this point, preliminary evidence suggests they're dramatically lower in the high snowfall region as compared to the mid snowfall. Uh, black bear populations appeared to increase between the low snowfall and the mid snowfall zone and preliminary data 
for the high snowfall zone suggests that the populations may be similar to the mid snowfall or, or maybe slightly higher. Over the last decade or so, there has been a lot of discussion about the number of wolves that exist in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Although numbers for the entire UP are not available, I asked Nick what the numbers look like in their study area. So in this high snowfall study area, it's around 800 square kilometers, and um, our last winter estimates suggest that there's eight packs comprised of between four to six individuals for somewhere around 48 total uh, wolves in this study area. Now this is compared to the mid snowfall zone where we were following between four and five packs, similar pack numbers between four and six individuals, so about half that. Then in Escanaba, um, there was around two packs in a similar sized area with four to six individuals, so between 10 and 15 wolves, depending on the estimate per year. So the purpose of the study is to take sort of a, a three-phase approach to looking at the role of habitat, wet, winter weather, and predators in deer survival in the Upper Peninsula, because even before the study was started, we had good reason to suspect that factors influencing deer were vastly different among low, mid, and high snowfall study areas in the Upper Peninsula. And so to do that, we really needed 12 years. Um, you need to spend more than one year in any given study area in order to get an idea of, of what factors are really attributed to that geographic area rather than just the particular year that you were working there. Um, and so in order to fund a 12-year study, obviously that's a, a large undertaking and this really wouldn't have been possible without the help of Safari Club International Foundation. Um, we partnered with the Michigan DNR and, and many other sportsmen's group funding organizations over the years who have contributed and helped get this project underway and keep it running. And I think that um, hopefully the results of the study will be available for a long time to help inform deer managers and sportsmen in the Upper Peninsula. We've been following this project for years, and once all of the research is wrapped up, we'll make sure to do one final segment on the results of this study. Special thanks to Todd, Nick, and the rest of the crew for all of the work they have done on this study and for letting me tag along on a morning of deer trapping in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Well, if you've watched the show over the last few years, you're probably familiar with our bragging board segment where we show different pictures that viewers have sent in of their hunting and fishing successes. Well, in this next story, we met up with a family who sent us in a picture of their 11-year-old son who is just obsessed with fishing. We figured we needed to spend a day with him. Last week, I had the pleasure of spending an afternoon on the ice with 11-year-old Drew Brunzik here in northern Oakland County. Drew's dad, Gary, and fishing buddy, Joe Schackermeyer, were here to lend a hand if needed. Drew wasted no time getting set up out here and was hoping to connect with some pike today, one of his favorites to fish year-round. I caught up with Drew to get the rundown on his game plan today. So we have um, nine uh, tip-ups up, and then three per person, and then we're probably going to set up three more since you came out. Alright. So what are you hoping for today? Hoping for a lot of pike. Okay. Pike. What do you like about it? Oh, ice fishing? Oh, I love just like being outdoors. That's pretty much... Just, like, How come? Well, I just like being outdoors. I'd rather be out, um, outdoor than inside because, you know, inside so you get all cramped up, but outside you're pretty much free. <laughs> All right. And what do you like about um, doing the ice fishing and setting the tip-ups and that sort of well, thing? Well, it's kind of like just a waiting game. And you can just like, you never know what, which one's going to pop up. Fishing is definitely a passion of Drew's. His dad, Gary, is happy to share the outdoors with him. Well, Drew loves the outdoors. And um, anything that I can get Drew outside, I get to go outside with him. So I uh, get the hall pass and get to go hunting and fishing. Uh, as long as Drew uh, asks um, his mom, I get to tag along. So <laughs> it's a good excuse to get out here. But again, I love, we love hunting, we love fishing, and anything with the outdoors that we can stay out here. Having him being outside versus being inside with the video games and stuff, I always have to find Drew. It's getting nighttime, it's dark out. He's usually outside fishing still. So um, usually I have to track him down outside. I think if uh, Drew's outside or kids are outside, they'll respect the outdoors more. So uh, he takes a little bit more passion uh, for the outdoors. He sees stuff, he'll pick it up, trash out. He tries to take care of the outdoors. He loves it outside, so he tries to take care of it. It's a good size. Good job. Thanks. That's nice, though. So do you keep yeah. the bike or do you set No, it? I'm a catch and release. That's all I do. It's a... Let's see where he's at here. That's 
roughly. We'll say 23. Yeah. Shy of being legal. Huh. Let them get a little bigger. I'm just gonna revive them like this, and then you kind of want to shake their tail to see if they want to fight. You just want to keep doing this until he's ready to go. You feel them fight back? Yeah. You, they usually just kick you. He's starting to turn, so he's about. Yep, he's ready. There he goes. He's just that. <laughs> All right. It's about two feet. I'm just gonna. So I'm right back down to this hole. Now wait until the next one comes. That's it. With tip up fishing, there's lots of time watching for flags. So Drew and Joe made a fire to stay comfortable. My dad and Mr. Joe taught me how to fish. All right, how long have you been fishing? As long as I can remember. To be honest, I think I was fishing before I was walking. What is it about fishing? What do you like? Um. I just love being outdoors. Anything outdoors I really just love. Probably be outside than inside. So for bass, I love catching bass in the summertime because you know you can see how big they are when they jump out of the water. And then like, it's always just a challenge just trying to reel fish in. It's fun, you never know what's gonna happen. So my strategy is that um, I always check the depths. So if it's like, right now we're realizing that they're looking more upwards than downwards. So like um, maybe like make like a get like something heavy and just like make it hit the ground, and then they'll like come over to look at it, and then when they look up, they'll see the bait and they'll come right for it. It gives it action, and then like um, like right now there's nothing really happening down there. So when it hits the ground, it like makes kind of like an explosion. So they want to come check it out. After a while, a swan wandered over to help watch for flags, and Drew talked us through his strategy for landing fish. So when I get a fish on the other end of the line, I always want to stand 180 degrees from where it's coming. So if it's going that way, I'm standing on this side of the hole. So it, when it, so if it's if I'm doing it not like the 180, it hits the side and it may cut the line. Wow! Look at that bass. The fish were starting to hit Drew's tip-ups, and the flags were popping. As he released this bass, he talked about setting tip-ups. We like to keep them spaced out, and then. Um, we don't walk by them because that could get like disturb the ground and could scare the fish away. And then you just want to mostly check the depth. Keep it like since they're looking up right now, you want to keep it up high. And that's really all. Well, another flag was up, and things were about to get a little more exciting. <laughs> you tried though. Yeah. That was a too. Oh. Well, after a swing and a miss, Joe figured a little lunch might be in order. He broke out the country smokehouse sausages, turned into the camp cook, and grilled up some delicious snacks that hit the spot on this already perfect day out here on the ice. After a quick bite, Drew walked us through what he's learned about bringing a fish through the hole. He and the guys all practice catch and release out here with everything they catch. So when it when it's really like um, running, just let it run for a little bit to tire itself out. Then you want to start pulling, not just like yank it and then like just keep yanking it because it could get the hook loose. When it's like coming up to the hole, you sometimes when it's a pike, you want to grab it right behind the head, or when it's a bass, you can just grab it right by the mouth. So when I'm releasing them back into the water, it's, we call it reviving. You just want to keep dipping them up and you want to shake them a little bit to see if they want to fight back to go back in the hole. It gets the water through their lungs to give them oxygen to um, fight back and want to go. Woohoo! Yeah. Look at that fish! We were waiting for one more today, weren't we? Yeah. There we go. There are so many other activities competing for our kids' attention these days. It's encouraging to see youngsters like Drew Bronsick spending their time outside and carrying on our great outdoor legacy here in Michigan's Out of Doors. Well, in this next story, Gabe Van Warmer is going to take us down to the Kalamazoo area for a traditional archery show and let us all see that there's still a lot of folks that love to hunt with stick and string.
Well, we've got our 24th annual Traditional Bull Hunters Expo that we're running. We started out in 1995 in Barry County up to their fairgrounds. If I remember my history right, we were there either two or three years before we outgrew that. And we came down to Kalamazoo and we've been here ever since. We've got 61 vendors from across the country. We've got some of the top boyers and some of the top aerosmiths and some of the top leather makers here. $10 admission to get you in for the weekend. We've got four excellent seminars. One's going on right now with Barry Wenzel, probably the godfather of traditional archery. And we've got Aaron Snyder, who's flown in from Colorado. And Aaron is, spends, from what I understand, roughly 150 days on the side of a mountain every year, hunting everything that you can imagine. We've got open shooting in our 3D course. We've got a 3D tournament tomorrow. And we've also got what we call a five shot challenge, which is a timed speed score round. Um, that's very popular. You'll get everything from advice to instruction. You can find every, you can test shoot bows. That is what this whole thing was based on, was being able to come and test shoot a bow before you buy it. And I think if I figured it out, we have 15 very top quality boyers here. And every one of them is, we're on the same page. You can get a bow, take it to our test area, which is sponsored by Three Rivers Archery. It's got eight targets down there and test shoot the bow all you want. Not only can you find companies with long histories of providing quality traditional products like Bear, Great Northern, Selway, and a host of others at this show, but there's also new innovations. Believe it or not, some advancements in archery come through the stick bow side of things first. One of those companies really starting to make a name for themselves is Day Six Arrows. Uh, one of the things is like with Day Six, you have a heavy carbon arrow and you know, I. Depending on how old you are, back in the day, 2315s, 2219s, you didn't have a choice. You were shooting a heavy arrow, but it was an arrow that could bend or break. Uh, with day six, you have a heavy carbon arrow, which is also not indestructible, but pretty close. And then you also have the tolerances of, in 28 inches, it's, uh, you know, 0 .0001 and so extremely straight. Uh, well, with this component system, you can use just about anything that you want. Um, with ours, we have a center pin, but you can also screw on whatever broadhead you want. Whether it's a glue-on type of a broadhead or a standard screw-in, any of those will work, which was very important to us. We wanted to have the, um, the tolerances of any other system, but also be able to use this. You weren't handicapped by one specific type of head. From the most recent innovations in archery to some of the oldest tools in human history, this show has it all. It's always fascinating to watch the guys in the Michigan flint napping booth work. So if I knock this piece off of a, a core or a piece of rock, right there is as sharp as it's ever going to get. Anything we do to shape it from that point forward actually dulls it. This is sharp at the molecular level. If you take an electron scanning microscope and look at this, it's smooth on the edge. A razor blade looks like this. So this is sharper than you can make steel. This cuts at the molecular level as well. That's why they use these to make scalpels for eye surgery, because they're actually separating between cells when they cut, and it heals really quick. The backcountry hunters and anglers were also on hand to talk about land use issues affecting us Michigan hunters. So in Michigan we've uh, fought against multiple bad bills. There's been some bad bills for wetlands and stuff last year. Um, there was some bills involving um, some ATV stuff in the Pigeon River country and while I like ATVs, lots of people like ATVs, they don't necessarily need to be everywhere. So that's some of the stuff we've done in Michigan and we've done a lot of stuff nationwide as far as LWCF goes, which is the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and fighting to keep public land um, in public hands as far as federal land goes. The whole weekend is a celebration of a simpler way of shooting, a challenge that only comes with shooting a stick and string. It comes down to, I want a challenge. I want a challenge when I step out there and shooting traditional archery is that challenge. So if you're looking to get into traditional bow hunting, don't miss this awesome event. It might just be the help you need to get the fun back in bow hunting. 
Thanks for joining us this week for Michigan Out of Doors. Make sure you stay tuned over the next couple of weeks. We've got some more exciting wintertime fun to be had before we transition into our Big Buck Night shows. If you'd like to see where we are and where we're headed next, you can always check us out online. Well, that's right, Jenny. Online is a great way to kind of keep tabs on us. Of course, our website is michiganoutofdoorstv.com. We're also on all the social media platforms if you want to see what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Got a lot of good stuff coming up over the next several weeks. We've got a brand new show next week, and then we're also going to have our Big Buck Nights East and West coming up in just a couple of weeks. So lots of good stuff coming here on the show over the next month. If we don't see you in the woods or on the water, hopefully we'll see you right back here next week on your PBS station. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by by Greenstone Farm Credit Services, making recreational land ownership possible across Michigan and Northeast Wisconsin. Begin your land financing journey at one of Greenstone's 37 locations or greenstonefcs.com. By Pictured Rocks Boat Cruises of Munising, exploring Lake Superior's Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore. With its sandstone cliffs, caves, waterfalls, and lighthouses, Pictured Rocks Boat Cruises on the web at picturedrocks.com. By Showspan, producing consumer shows that include the ultimate sports show in Grand Rapids. Over 350 exhibitors, outdoor gear, boats, seminars, Lake Ultimate, and Big Buck Night. The ultimate sports show at the DeVos Place in Grand Rapids. When I want to fire away, a dream stays with me night and day. It's the road that leads to my home state. I am a Michigan man. Changing seasons paint the scene like rainbow.